Hello, I am Leave Nelson B, musician for Lonely Ghost Records, and this is Talent with Alan. Here, we will go over recent Lonely Ghost releases, as well as those from affiliated artists in a quest to get liner notes that you cannot get in a digital era. I hope you enjoy. So, uh, all right. So we got uh, Famished, the Leave Nelson B remixes that we're going to be discussing today. Yep. And this is, uh, so I, you know, I recently got a new pair of headphones, those Master and Dynamics. I don't know if you saw me talk about that on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the portable ones, you, you got your first set that were broken or some shit. Yeah, but you know what? They're fucking great. This is like the best sounding headphones I've ever listened to. And when I listen to your songs on those, I notice so much more in the songs than what I did before. So I was really glad that I like listened on those before we talked about it. Cause I definitely noticed a lot more like subtle little things you were doing in the songs and stuff. So this album is an original album, but it's based on a remix from the uh, Famished EP that was put out in January by Famish, the band, right? So yeah. um, how did, let's start with just kind of like talking about before we even dive in, like how did that come together? What was the conversation you and Dom had? Obviously I was a part of it a little bit, but like, you know, how did you decide that this is what you wanted to do? Well, uh, when, when I, I think it was you that told me that we signed, that they, they, you guys signed uh, Famish and I heard the first single and I wanted to talk to them, but I didn't want to talk to them uh, empty handed. So I wanted to, so I, I, I did, I did a uh, back, which ended up being Queen Sally. I think like last November or something like that, and yeah. um, December maybe something in there, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a, it was around the release of three point X, and and um, yeah, it was just uh, it was basically to get the conversation started. Like it wasn't right. anything I planned to be to be released. It was just something like, hey, like I like your record. Here's what I did with it. You know, my name is Nelson. I'm also on the label. You know, you know that kind of thing, and. And yeah, it, was, it ended up being a good conversation. They really liked the record, you know. So, you know, it, it was a it was a win win, you know. Like, I mean, I, I I made a new friend, and I could uh you know do a talent with Ellen now without you know having that being a conversation starter between us, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it's it's a it's a really interesting take on that album because I feel like I don't know that the album is necessarily like an emo album, but I think it kind of has like some sad or undertones to it. it has some emo like, tendencies, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like in your album, there's a lot of like joy that comes out in it, just like in the, the way you sampled some of the guitars. I feel like you picked a lot of more like bright and major sounds that kind of made it down to the, the final versions of the songs with maybe Queen Sally being kind of the exception to that. But um, was there a reason why you decided to kind of go did you intentionally go that direction or, you know, does that just kind of how it worked out or, you know, well, is that a stylistic thing? I mean, the, the, the way the chops make sense to me and how they, and cause I just, I, I literally sit there and just like, I randomly chop stuff up and sometimes I do it in time. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I, 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 I just like, I irregularly chop. I think for Beck, that's, that's one thing I did. I just was like, um, let me get this done real quick. And, um, yeah, whatever the, the whatever what makes the most sense, and whatever like part of the track that I think needs more like embellishing, you know, yeah, because because uh, the, the the EP is short, and yeah, not 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 complaining, you know, but uh, the, the EP is short, and some of the more like melodic decisions made made in that EP, some of the progressions I thought were actually kind of beautiful, and I wanted to make repeat those, you know. You know, may basically make them like greater, make grander things, and you know, and as uh, Nathan said, like they, they had a decision to like roll off the top end, you know, to make it more like grounded and muddy, and you know, like you're like you're listening to like a more thick experience, you know. Yeah, you know, which like, I really like, like about that album. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so what I did artificially was try to introduce more of the high end, and you know, and more of the tracks, and like. 
like 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 chorus some things around so they are like you know more reverberated around and they feel more present like like uh dom's breathing is really present on yeah on on, on, on some of the tracks um you know. one of them it's like incorporated into the beat like really well i want to say it is i think it's the last one so lean so lean yeah, yeah i think you're right um and i noticed it and i never noticed it before i listened to these headphones and i'm like listening and i was like holy shit that sounds so cool like I never noticed it when I was listening on like, you know, my car even, which has pretty good, pretty good speakers in it. But um, I really like that. That was really neat. And I think a lot of the stuff that you did with uh, the vocal samples kind of, again, they kind of capture like a certain happier vibe than I think the album necessarily has. Again, other than Queen Sally, which kind of reminds me of like a Gold Panda song or something. It's a little bit more kind of down tempo and, uh, it's more funky like yeah melancholic a little bit though it kind of is like a sad sad electronic funk song or something yeah it's, so, more, it's, it's more funky it kind of ends on like a, a weird note you know like yeah and i i really like the way that 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 beck worked out and you know beck's part of the song i sat with the longest actually yeah, yeah. actually it is that was, the, that was the first single right i was gonna yeah. say well that was the first one so yeah. that, and you i do think i remember hearing like a different version when you first um, did it, or maybe, like, maybe, maybe I think I sped it up before I before I released it. I think I sped it up and added more like like layered some more things over the drums because I because uh, I I, I for, uh, production wise like I think I've I've learned more of how to do what I do better, um, and I think that's what makes this like my best sounding record. That you know I think I actually like gotten more to know what's inside the box in FL Studio. Yeah. And with the and with the my MPC as well, and uh, I think it definitely got things to sound more fuller and better. You know, the the better the better the sound system you have, the better it sounds. You know. Yeah. And plus, and plus I got my near field my near field speakers like now, so you know after listening because I don't just do the headphones now. I now have my near fields, which let me see if I can get these like like I have these uh oh, M audio nice. M audio near fields now. You know. Can't really see yeah. that one all that well, but yeah, but I have those. I have those now, and that pretty much makes mixing a lot easier, you know. So yeah, yeah, a lot, like uh, just flat, nice studio monitors. Um, yeah. So let's dive into the the actual individual songs a little bit more. So let's start with uh, Retreat ninety five. So my very first question is actually like, why is it called that? Um, I'm not sure. Like, like it, it just felt natural, like, to, to, to feel it. it. was like the working title I had was Retreat. And I think the way the drums sound, it sounds like it came from 1995, especially the way the song introduces them. Because uh, originally, I think, as you remember, like, the drums really didn't introduce the record at all when I first played it for you. You're like, just make the, yeah, like, often the drums aren't present in the front. And, yeah, once I did that, it made a lot more sense, you know. And when yeah. I and when I actually did the the, the WTFS and when it followed uh, indulgence and the drums just kicked in, I'm like, okay, this is this is great. <laughs> this is this, is, this yeah. is amazing, you know. But yeah, it was basically like the drums make it sound like you know a song that is maybe like thirty, like like twenty five years old, you know. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. I, I guess uh, I wasn't sure if it was like an allusion to some sort of uh, like video game or, or story or something because I know all the original songs are kind of are are uh, homages or oh uh, that and I was listening to like I was listening to uh, to Eminem show a lot Eminem show in uh in um what the hell is it uh, uh encore I was listening to Eminem show in encore okay. and and not on those hours but on the Slim Shady LP he has 97 Bonnie Clyde and I think that was in my mind too you know okay you know, yeah so. that makes sense that's um so with is there a particular reason how you selected the sample in that song because I feel like of all the songs on this album for whatever reason to me retreat 95 is like the most different sounding uh I think Mariah was originally I wasn't originally going to tackle it because you know the way the way the song plays but I think I, one day I, I think I just decided to I, I, I decided to just you know what the hell? Why the hell not? Just let's see what let's see what happens. And 
and it, it, it just made sense to uh like just make it like a running train of a of a of a, of a of a sample chop like i wanted to feel like it's always going forward you know yeah which it does kind of have that feeling of just like almost like perpetual motion yeah yeah and that's I, a it's a it's a pretty it's a really good intro song for this album i think because like it i don't know that it, not that it wouldn't fit in other places on the album but it definitely feels the most like an intro i guess like it really kind of does introduce you to the to the the project well so then you have uh, Hey Goodbye, which is sampling Nana, which is probably my favorite Famish song. So it went a direction again that I kind of wouldn't expect it to go. It does have a little bit of a happier, brighter sound, which I feel like Nana doesn't necessarily no, does sound that way, uh, <laughs> the original version. So so like, was there a certain inspiration for that? Uh, I definitely wanted to use that, like that, uh, that high-pitched synth, you know, and uh, have that be like which, the meat. Is that meat. from the original song? Yeah, it is from the original song. I didn't like, even notice it in the original, but when yours, it's like, yeah, I it thought is. you actually added that. So like, that's really, that's pretty cool. No, the only thing I added was drums. <laughs> like that, that's that, that's wow. that's the only thing I added. Every, everything lived and died with the with the sample. This everything was built with uh with the re with the record itself, besides the drums. But uh, but yeah, uh, it, it's a uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to make that high pitch the uh, high pitch because uh, I think I sped it up too i think i sped yeah, up the record yeah. and and it made that pop more and i think i wanted to like that too because like the way i got that high pitch melody to go the way that i had to like chop it and and, to, and sometimes it included like dom's vocals sometimes it didn't yeah you know? and it was really it, it, it was really an interesting experience and everything just landed right uh with uh with uh hey goodbye you know like it was it was just great yeah, it sounds so much more electronic than the original version, like beyond even just the sampling aspect. I actually did think you had added like synth or something to it. That's really kind of mind blowing that you didn't. Um, so that almost makes me think of like, uh, they reminisce over you, the sample by Pete Rock, where he was just able to hear like that, like fucking fraction oh. of a second of, of horn that was like super catchy and he like built a you know that whole instrumental around it i think it was a sample of what the mamas and the papas or something like oh no that was uh tom scott i believe tom scott there you go yeah okay. that was that was tom scott's uh, version of jefferson airplanes uh today there you go i knew it was some, like <laughs> really like yeah it was it's a it's a genre of music that it's sampling that i actually have never really been into it's or dove into a song that samples a cover of another song yeah it's a cover <laughs> song. and uh like it's so interesting how he was able to pull that out and i feel like in that song you kind of did the same thing where you like notice something that clearly i mean was there and it's good but like i guess maybe doesn't necessarily get to be at the forefront generally and i really really like that so there there is one there is there's one thing that i i was listening to that actually made me like want to that made me go that direction and that was uh uh dj jazzy jeff you know uh, uh will smith's old dj yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. He had a his first solo record, The Magnificent. Uh, I think the opening track is called For the Love of the Game. And it samples this George Benson record that's been sampled a million times, right? And it's been sampled a million times around where DJ Jazzy Jeff did, but nobody sampled the part where Jazzy Jeff. And it's like, it's so minuscule. It's so like, it, it's such a small part of the track that it, it's all it, it like when he makes when, when you hear the track it's like oh this is obvious this is the obvious like thing like you have right. to like take this no everybody took loops from literally a bar before jazzy jeff sampled it and like bar a bar after and never like the section that jazzy jeff did and and like it, it's so wonderful and beautiful and he builds uh, it builds onto it and it's just like it's so it's so good. If you if you haven't if you ever heard for the love of the game, you know it's see it's, uh, it's not, it sounds like such an obvious sample, but like it really wasn't for that time. And he was like the first one to tackle actually that part, that little like maybe four to seven second part of the record that nobody else tackled before. And that record has been sampled millions of times. When I like that's part of like why like uh the the glory day the golden age of hip-hop the, the jazz rap days was like kind of like boring because everybody sampled the same parts of this george benson record and records of, of its ilk 
but like when Jazzy Jeff tackled it, it was just so nice. And I was had that thing in my mind when I was doing uh, Nana. Well, so, so that's really interesting and it kind of makes sense to me. But one thing I will say is I don't feel like the jazz rap era was boring when it was done well. So I guess that well, it was I done well, think, but you really have to have like the differentiators out there. Like you have to, you yeah. have to be Primo or Q-Tip or, you know, exactly. like, 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 yeah, we were talking had, about a tribe called quest the other day. Like, you know, that's, um, that's a little bit different, but yeah, like when it was just kind of generic, it, it definitely all sounds. Similar. Yeah. Like when like brand Nubian was doing stuff or like, uh, and not no disrespect to MF Doom, but like KMD was doing so, like they sampled like the same sections of the same record, and like it was, it was, it was kind of trite at, at a point. Like, you know, yeah. especially like oh, yeah. back in those days. I, I think I just had a Twitter discussion like yesterday about like somebody was saying like I, I don't know if I can if I could pay more than ten dollars for a CD. Like CDs just cost like twenty bucks. <laughs> like, yeah, I remember going to Sam Goody and seeing like dilated peoples for like. A, <laughs> For oh, like yeah. eighteen dollars and shit, like are you kidding me? Yeah, like, that shit was expensive as fuck. <laughs> CDs used to be like as much as a movie almost. Yeah, like seventeen ninety nine. Yeah. Like you go to Camelot or Sam Goody or Waves. Like, oh, you remember Waves? <laughs> I don't actually. I never went to Waves, but Sam Goody, oh. Camelot, uh, yeah. Fye. Yeah, yeah Waves was like right in Ashtabula Mall, <laughs> and <it was> like <laughs> right next to Farmore. Back when there was a Farmore there, but yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, like that that was that was yeah, when Sam Goody took over took over Waves, like yeah, that's that's the last CD I bought at Sam Goody. And, and I remember thinking like, man, this is this is the CD's good, but like is it 17 dollars good? Like who's cleaning up at all uh, who's cleaning up after all this? Because I know Dali people ain't getting ten dollars out of the CD, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's uh it's kind of interesting to see all that stuff like come and go and also like CDs are going to come back in another five years because tape, I think that's just the trajectory. So it's like, you know, but vinyl the, and tape, it'll be CDs eventually. But like, yeah, all that stuff, I'm glad none of that exists anymore. Personally, I like just give it to me digitally. It sounds better and I don't have to fucking carry stuff around. So I'm kind of weird like that, but. But yeah, okay. like, like, yeah, Nana was definitely an experiment and minimal minimalism. And I, I didn't go over the, the entire track like I usually do. I usually try to get parts from the entire track and try to rebuild it and recontextualize the entire track. And I think I did that with most of the other records. It was better, especially if I bought the Cool Ranch Doritos. I definitely used the entire track on that one. But that's my hey favorite goodbye. track on the album, probably still. But, but for uh, Hey Goodbye, I, I just took a small section and I, like wanted to build like something unrecognizable you know to it right you know so uh we kind of talked about queen sally already a little bit and this is the one that reminds me the most of kind of like that down tempo electronic scene people like gold panda and giraffage uh that kind of make that sort of sample heavy music that has a little bit of like a funky but melancholic kind of sound to it and usually well, queen sally... do, like, it's tuning vocals and this and mess with the speed and you know i really I really enjoy that song. Um, I did, I did, for Queen Sally, it? I did not want it to sound like a sample. Like, you know what I mean? I did not want yeah. it, I wanted it to sound like, you know, its own native track. And that, yeah. that, that was where I was going with that one. Because I, I really wanted to pull out all steps, all stops when, you know, when this being my introduction, like, like you only get to introduce yourself to somebody once, you know? So, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, that, 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 was, that was my goal when uh, dealing with Queen Sally was not to make it sound like, you know, choppy or something like that, you know? Yeah, and it doesn't, it has a nice smooth sound. It definitely, I think that's part of why it reminds me of like Gold Panda and Giraffage. It like, you know, they're sampling stuff, but it sounds so organic and smooth that it's hard to tell where the sample starts and ends and like what they were sampling and how and like, especially in Queen Sally, I think that it's hard to identify even what exactly you pulled the sample from or from where, unless you're like really familiar with the song and know it well, it kind of just has its own kind of feel to it. It definitely has a, a more. Um, yeah, Cause I did that song yeah, not long after I did that track not long after I did uh, uh, the, the funeral homes track that has yet to come out. But it is on a live stream if you want to listen to it. But uh, but yeah, it, 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 yeah, I did that not too long after the funeral homes track. 
Okay. Now. And yeah, I can remember feeling like the funeral home track was probably going to be like my best track of re in recent history. Like, like I that's... think you've uh, surpassed that track, honestly, with uh, some of these personally, but at least for personal favorites, I think two of my favorite songs of yours are probably on this album, which are Queen Sally and I Brought the Cool Ranch Doritos. So let's talk about I Brought the Cool Ranch Doritos because that's like the chillest. I think that's probably the chillest song on the album. It kind of almost sounds like a dream. It has a very like dreamy kind of uh, like lower energy, I guess, than the rest of the album kind of vibe to it. it. I don't know that it's actually a slower song, but it doesn't feel as as high oh, energy. It's definitely a lower tempo. And Anohana was my favorite track off of, uh, off of, uh, off of the EP. And huh. especially that, like that indie guitar part really reminded me of uh, Going to California by Led Zeppelin. You know, like, at least the ending of uh, Going to California, Led Zeppelin, mm -hmm. when it switches keys and it gets into that, like, I, I don't know what the terminology is, but it changes key and it goes into the outro of the track. And it's, it's, a, it's a really nice song. I, and I don't fuck with Led Zeppelin like that. I was going to say, yeah. like, I don't listen to Led Zeppelin. So to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not super familiar with like any of their songs other than I know what stairway to heaven is but I my, really my father loved led zeppelin i think it was four was it three or four i think i think it was four they had they had like stairway to heaven and black dog and uh what else was on that record uh i, I forget but i know that i know i know uh going to california was on that record and you know and i, I always liked that record i mean i've liked led zeppelin that much but i definitely did like going to california a lot you know yeah and, my dad would very rarely listen to Go to California because it's such like just an acoustic guitar and Robert Plant singing. And yeah, that's what that track reminded me of. And I wanted, I wanted to sample that. I wanted something, I wanted to sample that really badly, you know? And the, the air, everything is like bare bones on that record. Like a lot of things are like in the box, unchanged drums, which I ne almost never do. <laughs> You know, like it's, yeah. it's a lot of stock sounds are in uh, are in uh, I brought the Coolidge Doritos, you know, and I, I think it just made sense. Like if it didn't make sense to compress anything, it didn't make sense to add like reverb to anything or an echo or a really loud reverberating clap or something like that. You know, it's it was very it was it was a very like straightforward, you know, everything can be centered straight down the middle type of a type of sample. And, you know, especially when it got to the end. Uh, that was like my favorite part of this of this EP, I think. You know, so it's, just... it's funny you say that because I didn't know that you hadn't changed a bunch of stuff. Like, and I was gonna say this sounds the most like a Famish song. Yeah, like it does. Of all of them, it does sound the most like a Famish song, probably. Like the others, I think, are farther removed, but this one kind of captures a similar feeling to probably, honestly, to Anahana. Probably, that's probably what I'm picking up on. But, um, oh yeah, you definitely pick up the guitar strums a lot, yeah. you know. Like yeah, it's it's yeah. I, I didn't want to. I just wanted to sound like a Lee Nelson B version of Anohana, as opposed to reinventing Anohana, you know. Yeah, it's probably the closest to like a a true remix in regard to like any of the songs that you did, because like I almost don't consider what you do to be like remixes at some point, because they're like basically just wholly original songs. It doesn't sound like the original you know like when i think of remixes i think of like you know more like what uh lil nas x did with old town okay. road or you know what i mean or yeah. even stuff that uh when uh 100 gex put up like that remix album and it's like you clearly this is the same song but there's some aspects of it that are changed where like with your music it's almost like you just happen to sample a song and it's a totally different song for the most part this is the closest thing i could imagine to actually being like a more like a well, this this, this could have been on a b-side if anohana was a sing was a single yeah i guess <laughs> i mean yeah. again I, I don't want to sell it short though either it is my favorite song on the album just because it has like a super dreamy quality that's like really nice to listen to you know once the sun starts going down and you're kind of hanging out it has like a really it sets the tone nicely for the evening you know but yeah, I really, I really like I brought the Cool Ranch Doritos, and, and I brought the Cool Ranch Doritos was like a working title that I just didn't think of a better one before I turned it in. Well, that's a lonely ghost title right there. You know, <laughs> dumbass fucking song name. So you know, <laughs> especially me. So I'm all, you know, I like that it's a full sentence. <laughs> yeah, it's probably um, yeah. So then finally we have uh, uh, Soul and Lean, which is a remix or 
sample solanin. So I, you said this was originally, or it used to be your favorite, right? Is it still your favorite song? I, I, th I, th I think it, it was definitely the most fun to do. It's the, okay. It was definitely the most fun song to do because there are so many parts of this track that I thought were just astronomical, and I wanted it to. And I wanted it to be two two records originally, but I I felt better just like merging one into the other and just making it bigger as it went on, and and I just I, it was definitely like the most fun of the tracks to to do. Hmm. And I think it might be the, the one I like listening to the most. And it's also the one that doubles the length of the original track, you know, damn near, you know? So yeah, I, I really, really enjoy doing this record. Uh, like the halfway point, like it definitely like gets louder and bigger. And I think I've managed like before, cause before doing this, I couldn't manage like the volume and mix it and, and like compress it down to where it makes sense. And I think I've definitely mastered that now. You know where I could have like an absolute yeah. like you know bonkers track with a lot of things going on, but still you can hear it and maybe not on like crappy speakers or something like that or on a, or on a phone speaker, but you can definitely hear it on on headphones and and stuff like that. You know, definitely yeah. you can hear like Dom's breathing. You know, adding like Which a, I, yeah, that adds a lot to it when you actually yeah. hear it. You're like, whoa, that sounds so. It sounds so cool. Yeah, yeah. it sounds vulnerable, and I wanted to be hopeful. I wanted to be a hopeful like track especially with, to conclude the record with you know you know i usually don't like ending tracks ending uh records with the longest track on the record but i think it's uh i think it worked i think it worked very i don't think any other place uh this record could have been on yeah i i really i mean i enjoyed what you did with all of them this one um definitely has kind of ending track vibes though i agree i don't think i could have seen this like it would have been a weird song to have maybe in the middle of the album or something like it kind of does feel like the, the, the period at the end of the sentence, you know? Um, and also just in general, like, like you, so you saying it would have been two songs. So would it have been, how would that have worked? That's interesting to hear. Uh, I, I was going to do a part one and uh, uh, just like, it's only, it's only reprisal, you know, like, cause you know, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, like, I forgot the name of the second Oasis album, but the second I never got into them either. It, it has <laughs> but... like a, a nine minute long song that is just like it the song just refuses to conclude. And I did not want that kind of feeling <laughs> on 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 this record. And um but yeah, the second the second Oasis album is just all it's awful. It is it is truly, truly just a bad listening experience. But I did not want to have that long, <laughs> long concluding record. I fucking hate Oasis, so I actually love when I hear people talk shit. Um, yeah, it's substantially longer than most of the songs in the album, too. Like, almost double the length of most of the songs. Yeah, yeah, it, it Which is. I guess, again, that makes sense if you were saying, like, it was originally going to be two. So it kind of... But it doesn't feel... Like, when I just looked and realized it was almost four minutes long, I, I did not ever pay attention to that like it never has felt like four minutes is a pretty long song to me especially for me especially yeah. for me yeah that that, that is a, that is a long track i never do like i very i don't think i i, I really do songs longer than like three minutes anymore you know i was like, gonna say you float around two minutes two and a half minutes usually i think so yeah I, I'm, I'm like knowledge in that in that regard where i like get an idea done and you know into like the shortest I, shortest version of that idea as possible and get it out the way that's how yeah. i like to do it too i like to kind of just like strip away everything that's not needed and just like focus on like having a complete thought that just starts and ends without it feeling repetitive or boring or you know what i mean so like i'm kind of the same way and i i like short songs in general um and Definitely. i think in electronic music it's smart to keep them short a lot of the times because it, you have to really earn a four minute song, you know what I mean? Like when it's built on samples and loops and stuff where it's already by nature repetitive, you kind of have to know what you're doing to make that captivating and sound dynamic and, and kind of like evolving. And in this song, it really does kind of evolve throughout it. And it never feels boring or like, you never find yourself sitting there listening and being like, all right, like is the song almost over? You know what I mean? And like a yeah. lot of electronic music falls into that, that kind of pitfall where it's like, okay, I get it, you know? <laughs> well, I think uh, for for me personally, I think uh, Earl Sweatshirt uh, definitely like made it okay to not have a hook, 
you know, to not have like a refrain and stuff like that, or like or a reprisal of a of an earlier idea. Like just get the song over with, get the best part of the song over with, and that's your track. You know, that's all that needs to yeah. be there. You know, like some rap songs was great for that. Feet of Clay also great for that. You know, like yeah, you know, and those are those are great great records. Like they're not they're not less because they don't have hooks. They're not less because they don't have refrains or you know a four bar intro or some shit like that. Like no, it's it's. And I think definitely like Earl Sweatshirt made me more comfortable. And plus, uh, Jay Dilla's Donuts does yeah, that no, too. Yeah, I was thinking of that too. Like you some know. of those songs are like forty seconds. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jay Dilla's Donuts does that too. Like where like yeah, uh, uh, here here here's here's what I can do with this, and here and it's and it's done as soon as you can like yeah wrap your head around it. You know, it's almost so. like uh, it's like almost indulgent in its lack of indulgence. You know what I mean? <laughs> like. Yeah. Like it almost like a kind of a kind of this like paradoxical way of looking at it where it's almost like, yeah, like you're not indulging in like anything, but it almost makes it feel like you're indulging in something totally different, but uh, in a good way, you know? Records are for the listener, right? They, yeah. They're for the they're for the artists, yeah, but records are for the listener. Like if you're not if you don't have the listener in mind, you know, and instead you're just going at it for with this like, you know. Oh, this is this is what I'm doing. Like you, you gotta you get because if you, unless you, unless you like feel comfortable listening to your own music, you know, you know, like you got you gotta come at it like a fan. Some sometimes, you know, it's like um, it's like planning a wedding, almost because yeah. like how many weddings have you been to where it has like where it's just it's just fatty. There's so much extra shit that you don't care about. You know, yeah. and all my favorite weddings are the ones where somebody thought about the fact I had to sit in a fucking seat for, yeah. you know, and watch all this happen or whatever. And those are usually pretty short because people are like, they don't want to sit through this ceremony. They want to get to the party, you know, like yeah. it's yeah. kind of the same yeah. idea. Yeah. And I, I mean, I agree too. Like, you know, if I were just making, like when I make music, I make very short songs at the final version, but the initial versions of things that I do, I'll build loops that I'll fuck around with for like 10 fucking minutes and I'll do stuff over top of it until I like something and I like all of it but then I'm like okay but I don't really need this or I don't really need that and I really especially when I make electronic stuff I really start to pare it down like any electronic you've, song you've ever heard that's been released by me originally was probably more than five minutes long you know like I was just fucking around and like I think um, you're right like you got to think about like okay you're right it was really fun for you to sit around and riff over something or, or mess around with it but like at some point, is anybody gonna actually want to listen to this? And usually, the answer is no. So yeah, there's, you know, there's you very back. few long-form electronic songs that I absolutely like or love, for for that matter. In fact, the only one I can think of right now is "Around the World" by Daft Punk. You uh, Dance yourself clean, if that counts. Okay, That's, yeah. That one is earns every fucking second. Um, yeah. Around the world does, and around the world's more traditionally what I'm thinking of, where it's like very repetitive, but like for whatever reason, that track does work. It bangs. What is man. it like six minutes long or something? Yeah, it bangs. It, it, it's like my number one driving song. Like if I if I'm driving, I'm listening to it around the world. I'm in heaven right now. Like yeah, it's great. Yeah, it is it's great. uh, it's not like Cascade or uh, Dead Mouse where I have like the intro sixteen bars just be like the bass, <laughs> the bass yeah. kick and uh, and the, yeah, it's not and, needed. It's like it's not needed. No. <laughs> but also, I think like somebody. I also think like a lot of those artists are tailoring it to like what the purpose of their music is. And somebody like Dead Mouse, you have those those bars of bass because it's like made to be at a rave or whatever. You know what I mean? So like, it's really not to listen to in your car at that point. It's really to like go see Dead Mouse. Dead Mouse makes music, so you'll go see Dead Mouse. I feel like, which I'm not a big fan, but probably because I don't really want to go see Dead Mouse. So you know <laughs> that's part of it. But like, yeah, I think. Um, I think it, yeah, electronic music can be really tough to get those long songs. And I think a lot of times electronic artists don't do the work of like going back and revising and being like, I don't need this, or this is like, you know. I mean, it's, it's definitely a very solitary uh, creation process, you know? Yeah, you don't you get know, a lot of people to tell you, I don't like this in the process. Yeah, you know, and like, you have to be good at that yourself. Cause even, even I think this EP is a, uh, I had nothing on the cutting room floor on this EP, like, which no, is not, like rare not, for you, right? Yeah, like you re really rare. Ask, so. No, like every everything that I did for this record, you heard, <laughs> you know. Like, yeah. So, I think only one I went back and did again was Nana, and and, and that, that that was that was it. Like that, that that was it. Like like everything that I worked through completion is 
basically what you hear, unlike you know 3.0 and 3.x, which you know though that those they're still songs that you know some of them ended up on the on the live stream, some of them did not, you know. But uh, but yeah, it was a uh, yeah. It, you you do hate like creative creative blocks sometimes, but when you're working on a project like this and and every time I sat down to do it, things started making sense really quickly. Right. You know, it's just, it, it felt natural. And, and like I said, like I told Don before, like good song, good tracks make good samples, you know? Yeah. Like even like with some of like the early rap records, like everybody had like their parents' records and their parents weren't buying like obscure shit. You know, they were right. buying, yeah, they were buying, buying the like hits. Popular music, yeah. Yeah, they were exactly. buying popular good music. And that's why those samples were, that's why those samples bang because those songs were good. You know? Yeah, like all the soul and funk that was being sampled. If you go and listen to the originals, those songs are really fucking great, yeah. and were yeah. like you said, a lot of times hits in their own right. Or if they weren't like out and out hits, they were popular within the genre. You know, and like it makes a huge like look at how much fucking uh, funkadelic and George Clinton are sampled. You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's for a reason. It's that's good music. It, it, period. Like, yeah. You know, and that's how I look at like the famous GP. Like it was a great, it was a great record. It was a, it, yeah, it was a great EP. It was a great introductory EP. It was a great, it was a great uh, act to sign to the to Lonely Ghost. And you know, I felt really happy with my uh, how my relationship with Dom developed over time. And you know, and I, I think that played into it well. Like I wanted to make them proud of this record as well. And you know, and and to greater to a greater extent the label you know especially like you know like i, I had no plans for this to come out you know like uh, yeah th- th- so soon either it kind of but... came out real quick like i yeah. think i got the final version in april and it came out in may so <laughs> yeah you know so that but yeah it, it it things just started things just was just rolling you know like yeah you know once especially once i got like like hey goodbye which i think was like a second track i did maybe but yeah like once things started rolling, it started rolling big for me. And, I, and I'm telling you, I have a lack of things to do. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, I got like a, a movie soundtrack going. I got a singles project going. I got, you know, I got an email train with people who are not give, who are giving me whack ass verses. I got a track with two killer verses coming out soon. You know, like, yeah, you know, like I, I and not to mention 4.0 is uh is still brewing too. You know, and this very podcast that we're talking on now. Yeah, it's, it's this well. very podcast. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, like, like this is this is def- this is definitely something I love to do. You know, and I thought I missed yeah. my chance to make to make something like this, like when I was in high school when I decided not to go to college and go into the military. You know, I definitely thought I missed my chance and to do this so quickly and for it to sound as good as a duck because this is my best sounding record uh, uh, from top to bottom. I kind of come like, around to that too, to be honest with you. I think this is probably my favorite composi- thing you've done. I mean, compositionally, I, I think I can argue that some tracks on 2.0 2. are going to be like, you know, my most proudest moments, you know, compositionally, but like as far as like production stand, production stand yeah. and uh, post, post-processing, post yeah, this is my best sounding, like more, most full sounding uh, body of work you know yeah like when i listened on the on the my new headphones um and i could hear like the product like more of the production like it translated to that higher quality space like really really well it sounded you know like what you usually hear when you listen to like really well produced music which is you notice things that you didn't otherwise you know and like when it's not necessarily well produced and it's not well recorded or whatever you usually don't have that experience if anything you just notice all the the shitty parts of the songs that were masked by the fact that your speaker didn't have that frequency band or whatever, you know what I mean? And like with this, it just like sounded so much more full and there was new things to like listen to. And, you know, like, I feel like I'm going to keep listening to it and trying to find more and more things I didn't notice before. Um, But yeah, like it's really well produced. It sounds great. It's a really polished album in my opinion. Yeah, it's definitely my yeah, definitely my best sounding, and it's all done in a box, you know. Like I didn't yeah. I didn't uh, bring any new plugins or nothing like that. Like everything was done in the box in FL Studio, and I, and I guess I kind of wanted to prove that it can be done that way. You know, you just have to know how to do it, and yeah, and not to mention that goes into like how how much better I am at it than I was before. You know. Oh yeah, I think like sometimes even month to month 
I'll get a song and then the next song is like better. And I'm like, God damn, that was a big jump. Yeah. <laughs> like, like not that the other one wasn't good, but like you can notice, you know, I can see your progress even sometimes song to song. Um, and that's pretty cool. Well, cause even when we were younger, like we would like, at least in my, in my mind, like I would always want better gear and stuff like that. Yeah, no, uh, that was my whole thing too. I thought it was all about the gear for sure. Yeah. yeah. Because people tell you it is, but it's, it's not. Oh yeah, like I, I I'm not a stranger to saying like music forums are just a, a hotbed for for toxic uh toxic ideas and and creativity and yeah. elitism and like honestly like some of the best albums are done with very limited equipment because I think that it fosters creativity and like if you are a creative and talented person sometimes that can actually be really inspirational to like the stuff that you're making you know and and not saying that like if you can't do that, you're not a good musician because there are people who do need more access to more things in order to really explore. But I, I think that that's a, a definitely a, a myth that's very prevalent um, in those forums of like, you have to have this sort of recording equipment, you have to have this gear and it has to be this brand or it has to be a super expensive and like, like. I can't tell you how many times I've been told, oh, I need to get uh, I need to get like, I need, uh, what was that fucking software that I hate? a reason i need to get reason <laughs> or oh, yeah. you know like or i need to get, get like uh, a pro tools or something like that like no i you don't need that stuff you know like like I'm, i don't no, need to I mean, reinvent nice my entire you workflow it. yeah it's nice if you can have it but like honestly you know what you usually need is like just a decent interface and uh some know-how you know um and like in your case i mean you know you kind of show that like you're not using a big ass studio or something, you know, like you're, you're yeah. hanging out with uh, an NPC in your room for the most part, you know, <laughs> like yeah, I mean, I'm sitting right here. Yeah. I'm sitting right here with either this thing or this thing, you know, <laughs> like it's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's basically my creative, uh, my, 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 my tactile creative like force, like is either this or, or this, you know, and that's, and I think, I think I, there, there's a point in time where the gear, like it, I guess it is an issue. But at some point, Can like be, yeah. you, once you have it, like there's a newer version of the of the of the NPC Touch, and I don't, I don't want it. I, I want this one. You know, like yeah. I know what this one is. I know what it feels like. I know you know which knobs are act funny because I you know kind of dropped it sometimes or whatever the hell. Like I I I, I need this one. You know, if I were to get a brand oh. new one, I would be lost again. You know. Yeah, that's like me with my Chaosolator. I mean, it's not necessarily the best instrument especially my version, it's pretty old. Mine's like 15 years old or something like that. But like, I know how to use it. I like it. I know how to make things that I want to make with it. So it's like, I could upgrade or get a new one or whatever, but like at the end of the day, I'm just going to have this big ass learning curve. And I don't think I necessarily gain from upgrading first, or if it even is an upgrade versus using what I am comfortable with and know how to do well. So, you know, I think that that's always something to consider. I mean, some of like, uh, the acid flashback at Nightmare Beach uh, took too much was recorded on a fucking iPhone, yeah. literally, and that album sounds great. Like that's a that's a pretty good album, and like, you know, that was done. Well, even iPhone. even like the Freddie Gibbs and Mad Live albums, like those beats iPads, made on an right? iPad. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. that's insane. <laughs> like yeah, like you know, people can talk shit or like be elitist or whatever, but like the other thing is like most artists that I meet who like are established and have made work that has gotten uh, some sort of a claim, you know, or whatever popularity, you'll notice that a lot of them don't give a fuck about that kind of stuff at all. No, because like it, it, you, you, every once in a while you'll hear, like, I don't know if you remember the Sound City documentary with Dave Grohl. Um, no, I don't think I've ever seen that actually. Basically it, it was, I mean, granted like, it's sad that the studio had to be torn down and stuff like that. Like, cause a lot of great records are before in there and the soundtrack to that documentary is just phenomenal like you have like the like a guitarist from cheap trick and Corey taylor on the same track you know yeah you know like like yeah stevie nicks and paul mccartney you know like it, 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 was, it was it was a great soundtrack but the underlying message where like you know like the digital creative space and music is like ruining music i really disagree with you know, it's, it's not so, like, like, yeah, you can, you can tell there's something inherently good about like a drummer having to practice like a million times to get the, you know, the, the drum parts right. 
but like I don't have that time and I don't I'm not paying for that studio time and I'm not micing up a fucking bunch of drums with SN57 you know like I'm not doing that well you know? I think it also <laughs> like speaks to like privilege right to a certain degree of like I think the arts, yeah the arts have historically been made for wealthy people right like literally historically if you look at famous authors who are allowed to make that their career, famous painters who are allowed to make that their career, their careers, not people who died poor, people who were able to sustain themselves from art came from wealthy families. Being an artist was a luxury. It wasn't something that a lot of times was like democratized. And I think the internet and electronic spaces have been able to help people do that. Like you can make a good track and not be adept at a singular instrument, but you could be really good at three others. And like, that should not be something that prevents you from being able to be creative. You know, and like, I, I don't know. I think that there's something to be said for that. Like, well, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that you know, like, like Eric Ketz, the drummer for Stone Temple Pilots, did all that practicing and shit. But you know, at the end of the day, like, does Eric Ketz own his own music? Like, like, yeah. you know, doesn't like doesn't matter. You practice all that, so you and G could own your shit. Like, and like you're gonna you're gonna preach too, right? to me like, about that shit. Like, you know, you had like the least amount of business acumen, you know, or like, you know. I, I just I don't know I don't buy it I, I think it's I think it's just awful like the way like people look down on you know better musicians and stuff like that and like yeah there's some, you know, something to be said about analog sound you know because that's the way sound is supposed to be heard you know yeah sure I'll listen to the argument but don't make my music any less you know because yeah. uh, it's digital signals and we're made with digital samples and you know like it, 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 this is brute force, you know, brute force of how I became to do this. And not to mention, like, in the tradition of hip hop, like, that's like musicality wasn't really, wasn't really like the, the thing. It was like the will, the force of will in which this music came to exist, you know? You it's know? hyper creative too. It's, it's not necessarily always worrying about like, like coming up with, you know, the part that will be sampled, it's recognizing the sample. Right. So like that's its own different set of skills that I think people don't give sample based artists credit for either, which it's like knowing how to identify like a really good sample to build a song around is hard. Most people can't do it. Like, you know, again, it takes a certain type of thinking and talent to be able to listen to like some bullshit cover song and then pull out like the, the one second of catchy horn from what sounded like somebody freestyling over you know, uh, an instrumental for three minutes on a fucking horn. Like there's something to be said for somebody's ability to do that. And like, it doesn't negate the fact that like, it's impressive the horn player played that horn and all that too. But like, it doesn't, like you said, right. It doesn't like make it less. And like, as somebody who also is a solo artist, like you can't be the best at everything, but I don't think that that means that you shouldn't be able to try out. Well, like you said earlier, something me. that you want to hear. Well, the song you referenced earlier, uh, ta- the the they reminisce over you, like before, be, be, yeah, before you heard, before when you heard that horn, like it, it didn't mean that much. But if you hear it on they reminisce over you, you're done. You yeah. know what's coming. You know you're excited now. You know like like yeah. it elicits a, a feeling that it's it not listed before. You know like exactly. Like, if anything, it makes the, it makes the yeah. original better. If not, like it doesn't make it less. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, and also just in general, like you said, with bedroom music, I think it gets shit on a lot, but also like, but yeah, like the quality of bed of stuff put out in bedrooms is higher than like actual studio recordings were 20 years ago. So it's not like, um, I think there's a lot of stigma around that stuff that's not warranted. And I think it does gatekeep and prevent a lot of very talented people who don't have a lot of money from being able to enter those spaces because yeah. ultimately like it's all fine and good when you hear somebody say like oh well this would be better if you recorded at a studio great do you have three grand for me to go record at a fucking studio yeah do you have studio you know what I mean? like <laughs> like do you, do you gotta yeah. do you gotta mix yeah. console do you got pro tools and shit like <laughs> i fucking yeah you know i mean it's you uh, and also, like, some of my, a lot of my favorite music is coming from people making shit in their bedrooms. I mean, to a degree, even somebody like Tyler Creator was started as kind of a bedroom artist. Like, yeah. they were recording in that fucking house that they all lived in. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Tyler Creator. Uh, even, like, Boston's Boston. Like, one of the best-sounding, probably the best-sounding debut record 
you know, especially for the time it came out. Like that was recorded in some dude's basement, you know, who had like used equipment yeah. everywhere, you know, like, like it, it's, it's yeah, insane. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's just a, it's an interesting perspective that people have. And again, like, don't get me wrong. I do like studio music, obviously, you know, but also I will say like, I listened to Sum 41's most recent record and my biggest gripe with that record is that it is too polished. It's too much. It doesn't sound good because it sounds too good. And I know that sounds stupid, but like, I do think that like, there's always a trade-off between like polish and like, maybe like organic or like, uh, you know, like emotional sounds. Like the more you polish it a lot of times, the more you lose some of those other aspects. So, I was just listening to Chuck the other day and I really- is a great album. Yeah, yeah I, I, I really like Chuck. And yeah, uh, I love and that album when it Nothing hits as hard as Chuck, I, I, I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, that album is pretty badass. I'm trying to think, it was really heavy too. Like yeah. it's, it's a lot heavier than than uh, I expect. I remember when it came out, I was expecting something a little bit more pop punk, and it was not quite that. It had a lot of really like great moments in it, and they're really heavy live too. They're a fun band actually, but but uh, well, yeah, right, well, it's definitely not like does those does this look infected era like you know? No, yeah, it was a big <laughs> switch. Which sucks because they only kept it for like that one album and then they kind of, I think somebody quit the band or something and it got weird for a while and then, you know, they finally came full circle. Yeah, I mean, Cody, I think it was a, a Cody Heat and Cambria influence if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken, you know, like for it to be that heavy. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's another band where it's like, damn, they had a couple of albums there in the middle, uh, three and four that were just like, wow, you know, they were really badass records yeah i i agree but uh all right well uh anything else you want to say about the the famished remixes uh listen to the original famished record uh famished yeah uh, it's very very good uh and by a, a des yeah there's an lgr lgr uh hoodie there pretty badass pretty yeah. cool pretty, pretty badass we also have shirts because it's summertime uh, yeah, you don't have to get a hoodie. <laughs> yeah, uh, white people dot store. Uh, that's where that's where you get those at. Um, uh, tell us, Alan. Uh, yeah, we had a we had a great great uh, first half of the year. Had everybody from uh, from Famish to uh, Get Tough to you to uh, I believe Funeral Homes. We had Funeral Homes Kixie. on. We had Ho uh, Holy Kerouac, uh, Kixie even. And uh, yeah, home is wearing uh, hey, give I love and take. You. Yeah. yeah, give and take. Yeah. Uh, you know. Hey, I love you next week. Yeah. Hey, I love you should be coming out, you know, by yeah. the time this is out. So yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a great, se it's been a great season. And I definitely learned a lot about, uh, about making music, you know, doing the podcast. And I think it's, I think it definitely worked its way into this EP, you know, so if you definitely, if you want to know more like tricks, you know, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely listen to the podcast. You know, I, th I think uh, Get Tough did a lot of like technical tips. Yeah, to, Get Tough to... was, was pretty technical. And yeah. like, I unfortunately am not good with that kind of stuff. So like, I'm never going to be able to evoke that from you. But uh, yeah, Get yeah. Tough and uh, and uh, and uh, Famish, they, they they actually did a lot of like mixing, mixing stuff that I definitely took to heart, you know, especially the decisions uh, to like, to just completely x out a frequency that you're not that you're not liking you know or that you that you're looking to evoke a feeling you know yeah and yeah like yeah listen to famish if you haven't listened to uh lavender house do that now <laughs> you know so the, the 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 every episode i think we remind we remind <laughs> people to do that <laughs> yeah yeah, listen to Lavender House like right now. And uh, our last Halloween split was actually very, very good. I think deserved a lot more play. You know, I think yeah. I have some of my best songs and it's definitely some of uh, Funeral Home's best songs on there. You know, uh, the last Super Destroy record is phenomenal. I appreciate that. Uh, the um, next one's better, I think. That's pretty exciting for me because I feel like I finally hit my stride on that one. So I'm excited. And anybody who listened to this probably already listened to Hey, I Love You and failed to buy a tape. You know, so. <laughs> yeah well you know uh <laughs> hey i'm sure we'll have some more coming out at some point i just we're gonna take a little break we're gonna pivot to some other things with them but um yeah also like you said if if this is the first episode somebody's checking out 
you know, definitely dive into some of those other ones. I, I've really liked every single interview that I've heard. I mean, you know, I edit all of them. So, uh, Arise, sir, we forgot to mention him, but he was the original. Yeah. Yeah. Arise, sir, the original, the only person that's been interviewed twice so far. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Arise, Ar Ar sir, uh, probably the, probably the person that listens to the most music that I listen to, uh, Besides you, of course, because you know, I was gonna we, say we, probably we have, me too. We, we have we have a mutual love for Old Dirty Bastard and Chronic Future and and you know, Tribe Called Quest and, <laughs> and not to mention uh uh oh man uh Daft Punk Daft Punk yeah Daft Punk <laughs> we talk a lot about those throwbacks we're gonna have to do an episode on a few of those soon yeah uh, you know that'll be that'll be fun too uh, I'm I'm winding down so all right well thanks for talking to me Nelson. Uh, no I really problem. enjoyed the record, and I'm glad that uh, we could we could dive in a little bit more. Yeah, man. Uh, the new the, the new the new Super Destroyer is going to be great. Well, I appreciate that. I hope so. <laughs> All right. So.